Please pray with me. May these words that I speak be grounded in my soul, encouraged by the God presence in me. And may these words that you hear be captured by your soul, enlivened by the God presence in you. Amen. Amen. The story of the prodigal son is one of the best known parables that Jesus offers in the Gospels. And I have made you hear it twice this morning in hopes of bringing more of the detail of this complex story to light. I have learned a lot about this story over the last couple of years and have come to see in it a deeper message about what real compassion looks like. I also discovered at Bible study this week that this story is a difficult one for many, and I hope that I can open it in a way that brings new life to it. One of the challenges we face in trying to understand a story that is 2,000 years old and belongs to a different culture is that we tend to interpret it through our own experience and our own culture. This story suffers greatly when we try to view it through 21st century eyes and minds. It is easy to get caught in the good child, bad child way of looking at this, which leads us to make judgments about the sons. There has also been a tendency uh, towards seeing the father in this story as a metaphor for God, knowing that because we believe God to be compassionate, it is therefore easy for God to welcome back the sinner. The problem with this kind of interpretation is that it makes it easy for us to get off the hook by not recognizing that it is the compassion of a human father, of a human parent in this story, that Jesus is challenging his listeners to become themselves. And I am not saying that God is not part of this story. Rather, I believe the story encourages us to know that God is experienced when we act with compassion, no matter what the circumstance. So I invite you to come with me into the heart of this story, to see it from the perspective of first century Mediterranean folk, and from there to open to the power of that story in our time and place. And in doing so, to put yourself in the place of each of the sons and of the father to ask, how do these actions reflect my own? Jesus lived in a dyadic culture. I have talked about this before, but need to say this again because it is central to understanding this story. Dyadic cultures are rooted in honor and shame. And honor and shame are determined by the community, not by the individual. A person is born with a level of honor based on family and maintains or loses that honor by the quality of their obedience to the expectations of the whole community. So let's examine how honor and shame play out in this story. In the first place, Jesus is provoked to tell this story because he is eating and conversing in the company of tax collectors and sinners. And it's interesting that tax collectors are, are separated out because they're even worse than sinners, <laughs> somehow. Um, the religious authorities who are present, the keepers of the law, the bestowers of honor, are upset because Jesus is disobeying the law by the company he is keeping, bringing shame to himself and bringing shame to any non-sinners that might be present in that group. It is in this context that Jesus offers a parable, and actually three, because he begins with the uh, lost sheep, followed by the lost coin, 
and then finishes with this really long and detailed story of the prodigal son. The story begins with the younger son asking for his share of inheritance. In this culture at this time, it was extremely unusual to distribute inheritance before death. And if it was done, the parent, by law, was entitled to live off the proceeds until they actually died. This request itself brings shame on the younger son because it suggests that he is wishing his father was already dead. And it is amazing that the father didn't discipline him on the spot or disinherit him. But no, the, and, and the elder brother is no better in this because he accepts his half, making no effort to reconcile his younger brother and his father. And it was also a requirement of the law that if there was a dispute in a family, the elder brother was responsible to heal and reconcile. He makes no effort. And he brings shame on himself as well. The younger brother sinks deeper into shame by leaving the village to travel to another country. No one ever left the place where they were born except on pilgrimage. And you can be sure that the village would be infuriated. And the younger brother continues this downward spiral of shame. He spends voraciously shame, losing everything to non-Judeans. Shame. When famine hits, he becomes a slave to a Gentile. More shame. And agrees to feed pigs. Oh my goodness. The worst shame. When he hits bottom, it is starvation that motivates him to examine his life. And I believe the starvation or hunger that Jesus names here is not just physical hunger, but, but that it suggests an emotional, mental, and spiritual starvation as well. And as this younger son looks at his life, he realizes he can no longer support himself, he feels dead, and he can no longer care for his father. He becomes remorseful. The younger son, I believe, experiences metanoia, that Greek word for a change of mind and heart. He finds new life. And he resolves to go home, but not as a son begging for forgiveness. He resolves to go home and ask to be a hired servant so that he can repay what he has lost and care for his father. And he is willing to accept by returning that the village, the community, will disown, reject, and abuse him, stripping him of the honor that he once knew for a coat of public shame. Just imagine that walk home. And then we get our next twist. As the son approaches, his father once again acts totally out of cultural character. He sees his son and runs to him. That was completely inappropriate for an elder. An elder waited for someone to come to them. And he broke that norm. And then he runs the gauntlet the village has prepared for his son by publicly forgiving him, by kissing him repeatedly. The father, driven by compassion rather than the code of law, heals their broken relationship in a moment. And then, witnessing his son's remorse and humility, he publicly celebrates his return, calling the servants to bring the best robe, a ring, and sandals for his feet. These are all strong cultural symbols. 
the best robe would have been his father's own robe, which would guarantee the village's acceptance of the prodigal at the banquet. The ring, as in our culture, was a symbol of trust and promise. And the sandals are a sign of being a free man in his father's house. Free folk wore sandals and the servants were barefoot. And the servants um, signal their reacceptance of the son by placing the sandals on his feet. And then there's the fatted calf, which technically belonged to the older brother, who uh, a calf that would feed the entire village, the entire community, and would prod that community toward forgiveness and a restoring of honor. Now, if Jesus had ended the story here, it would have been one of those happily ever after kinds of stories. But he doesn't end the story here. And the last part of this story is the part that hits closest to home for those listening then and for those of us hearing that story today. The elder brother approaches and upon hearing what is going on, dishonors his father by publicly humiliating him. When the father comes to him, again, the elder goes out to the field to, to the son. When he goes out to him, the elder brother insults him by addressing him without a respectful title. You would always address an elder with a title. And he, he shouts, listen! And you can imagine under breath he's saying, you doddering old fool. Listen! This son of yours. And he accuses his father of favoritism another dishonor. And this brother continues his downward spiral by refusing to acknowledge his brother by calling him this son of yours and adding a further cultural insult of accusing his father's son of spending all of his money on prostitutes. That comes in, that wasn't in the first part of the story. That's his addition to it. More and more dishonor. These actions, to me, indicate that the, young, the older son also wishes his father dead, just as the younger son had wished at the beginning of the story. And the father responds to another wayward son in the same way he welcomes back the first, with compassion, in acts of self-humiliation. He returns his elder son's insult of not addressing him with dear son and assures him his inheritance remains, no harm done, and invites him to join the celebration. I can only imagine those first century listeners of this story gasping and rolling their eyes and shocked at what Jesus was saying in this story. And then he ends the story there. Not because it is finished, but rather because he knows the end is up to each of us. I wonder what the elder brother decided to do. Would he choose to hold firm to the cultural code of law, or would he choose to step outside of the village expectations in the name of compassion, in the name of love? Jesus understood that God was in compassionate, caring relationship and not in obedience to a code of honor. Jesus understood that every human being had value, a right to be at the table, just like those tax collectors and sinners. 
rather than being valued according to what family you were born into or what value the village gave you. It was this understanding of the way of God in life that got Jesus killed. He challenged the very essence of what it meant to be in community and stripped away the power of the village to make or break people's lives. Our Lenten journey brings us closer and closer to Jerusalem, closer to what it means to stand up for what we believe as people of God, even in the face of death. Our challenges to make God central to our life experience and that of our community are different than they were for Jesus, but no less important. Where he lived in a culture that held everyone to a strict code of conduct, we live in a culture where it seems anything goes. Where he lived in a culture that demanded purity <coughs> above all else, we live in a culture that has lost touch with ethic and moral values. Where he lived in a culture that used fear as a way to ensure belief in God, we live in a culture that fears people might actually believe in God. We will sing shortly the hymn, Christ has no body now but ours. And if we believe that is true, then we need to set our minds and hearts on what that means for each of us and as a community of Jesus' students. I believe we need to raise our voices in defense of God, in support of justice, and in honor of love. We are being challenged to compassionate lives and compassionate living, the very heart of God. Jesus is calling us through the story of the prodigal son to deepen our roots and spread our wings. Deep roots of wisdom and faithfulness will ground us, giving us strength and courage to spread our wings and soar to the very heart of God. For that, I believe, is when compassion reigns.